Does anybody not know who I am? So I don't need to introduce myself? You can start if you like. All right. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's been going on with device drivers, because that's primarily what I work on, device drivers, and what's happened in the past year, and what's continuing to go on, and what's planned for the future. Let's talk about ACPI. Not a whole lot has happened with ACPI recently, mainly because it's, it's pretty stable. But I did update the Warpin installer, so it will now install on pretty much any OS2 system, not just ECS systems. May I ask a question? Sure. What has changed? <coughs> what has changed? Yes, in Warpin, previous. Well, the Warpin installer used to make sure you had a specific version of ECS, or it would not install. Has there been anything done with regards to another code base? Because if you try to use warp in, and you want to add, for example, Chinese, which I was doing for one program, it, you couldn't change the code page. But this is not it doesn't work, it's an old problem. What does that have to do with the ACPI? Warp in store. Oh, warp oh. in. It's not the warp in itself. No. Oh, oh, sorry, okay. Not warp in, no. You're talking about within the ACI project, it's now. Right, right. Yes. You're, you're in need of a vacation. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I it's the heat. <laughs> it's the heat. But when, one of the cha recent changes to the ACPI. PSD itself is I added support for a high resolution timer. That's SMP safe. And that wasn't in previous versions. I continue maintaining it. It's kind of pretty much in maintain maintenance mode right now. I, uh, every time a new ACPI CA module is released from Intel, I do update that. And every so often, I'll, I'll put a new release of the ACPI package that incorporates all the newest updates. So far, nothing really affects anything, although we are running the current version of the official ACPI component architecture code. And like I said, it's pretty stable and reliable, which is why it's mainly in maintenance mode, which is a good thing because that frees up time to work on other things. New versions will be available in the Arkanoa subscription package, the software package. Any questions? Let's talk about JFS a little bit. One question, what, what's about uh, suspend and resume for, for notebooks? Uh, I think that's a problem, still a problem with ACP. Yeah, and it probably will continue to be a problem for quite some time. If it works, you're lucky. If it doesn't work, you're unlucky. Does it work on your P60? Yes, it does. Why doesn't it work on mine? It works on mine. <laughs> and that's a lousy laptop. I've, I've seen more people, by the way, complain about spend and zoom not working with ACPI on OS2, but I think it's really time for a wake-up call for these people because at home we have a desktop system running a current version of Linux, and in about 25 to 30 percent of the cases, the system never comes back from suspend and zoom. So it's the same thing, and I've seen more of these cases where. Uh, suspend resume with ACPI it doesn't always work with Linux either. So, you know, it would be great if we could get it working on OS2 and it would work better. But, yeah. I thought that you once said that there was also something critically missing. Well, yeah, let me, let me, let me make some comments about that. Suspend resume is an extremely complex operation that requires a lot of support or help from the kernel. And we don't get that support with the SMP kernel. So there's going to have to be a lot of work done to kind of work around some of the limitations in order to get that to work. It's a major project, and other things are probably more important at this time rather than spending time on that. So there's not being any work done on Suspend Resume right now. It's still on the list of things to do, but it's lower down on the priority list. And as with all of the OS2 drivers, we try to support as many possible hardware configurations as possible, but we cannot possibly support every single piece of hardware 
out there, especially the, the low-end things or the edge case things. It's not guaranteed to work on every, part every single system. It will work on most systems, especially the most generically compatible systems. So don't expect it to work everywhere. And do we have IBM laptops or Dell laptops or something Suspend like resume? That. Well, anything. In this. We, we're not no. specializing in the particular categories of tests. On the, on the wiki, it does list the things to stay away from. Okay. Systems to stay away from. Acer systems, not Acer. I don't remember. Um, it does list the, the certain systems to stay away from. It's on the Arkanoa website. Okay. Go to the wiki, go to support and wikis, and then the ACPI page will sh will list the things that are that are known to be problematic. And there's only a couple, really. Yeah. All right. Moving on. JFS. Yeah. I fixed a uh, very serious problem with the uh, log redo portion of check disk, which used to run every time you booted your system. And uh, that unfortunately created uh, some very serious problems, which corrupted your disk and then told you everything was fine, and then let you keep using it, which is not a very good thing. And, and then later on, long time down the road, you would have a catastrophic problem with your, with your disk. But that's been fixed now, so you should be using the latest version, which is available with the Arkanoa subscription service. Um, there are still a couple of known problems with the JFS, but they're very, very rare, and I doubt most people would ever see these. There is a known problem with the check disk. Sometimes when it runs, it will, uh, it will trap, but um, that's rare, and there's a slight possibility that that may have been caused by this prior log redo problem. And then there's a problem that's been reported where you have lots and lots of files on a very, very, very busy system that sometimes there'll be a failure. But since that is so rare and requires a very, very busy system with lots and lots of files, it's really, really hard to reproduce. No, these are unfixed. The last two things are still oh, oh, yeah. of things that I know about that still exist. And once again, they're very, very rare. So, so, what's that? Yeah, yeah. They do, they, they are known, and, but we need to accumulate more data on these in a very controlled situation, like I need a, a memory dump when it occurs. Would be very nice to see. You do? Yes. And how can that be caused in our USB stack? Uh, but the new stack uh, didn't work for me, and I, I don't really don't have a subscription to the uh, latest ones. Uh, but uh, my HBFS drive on USB has not that problem. Really? Because part of my. Um, QA testing for the USB stack, which I'll get to I'll talk about USB in a little bit, does, part of my QA testing opens up six threads that simultaneously beat on a single JFS drive for over an hour. And it has to pass that test in order for me to release it. So, okay. I knew though there, and the, yeah, I do know there were some SMP problems with the USB stack in the past. But those single CPU, ah, single or, CPU. Uh, get their latest version. All right, moving on. USB 11. Let me talk a little bit about the USB stuff. The USB 11 was created because we needed to have a stable stack that worked reliably on most systems. So what I did is I started with 
the uh, USB drivers that Lars and Wim Brule and everybody else had been working on, and then basically took a snapshot of that and then tried to get it to a stable place. And what I did is I fixed some of the regressions because anytime you change things, it's a possibility that you'll have regressions. That's just, that's just a fact of life, you know? So I fixed the ones that I could find of those. And I also fixed some long-standing problems that had not yet been addressed. There are some really nasty things deep down inside some of the HC drivers and other places that they've been around since the original IBM drivers. And I took care of some of those problems. So what we have now as of the current versions, it's pretty stable and reliable and works on most equipment. Oh, thank you. That's it. That'll work. Okay, and once again, as with everything, they're not guaranteed to work on every single piece of hardware out there because there are fringe, there's fringe hardware. There's some things that just have problems, but it should work in the majority of cases. In any of the remaining cases, we'll either need some very, very specific data collected by the reporter who reports a problem, or I need to be able to replicate the problem on my own equipment because they're just very complex at this point. The simple things have all been fixed. Now we're down to the difficult things. Uh, we have DFC as well to, uh, to fix uh, hardware problems. Well, DFC only looks at disk drives, the data. It's yeah. not yeah. really for hardware issues. No, no, no. But the configuration, the, the, the cylinder, the CHS, uh, we're, talk geometry we're, talking about geometry. we're talking about USB we're devices, mouses, keyboards, printers. Right. Not just USB mass storage devices, like a USB stick. Okay. There's much more sadly to it. So that's kind of what's been going on with the USB. The latest things I've been working on are fixing some issues with the USB calls. I know Wimbrill did a lot of work getting kind of combining all the scattered variations that were out there and combining them all into one thing that will work everywhere. He did a really good job with that. There were a couple of issues still that compatibility issues between different systems. I mean, yeah, it worked on his equipment, but there were tickets that came in where it didn't work on other people's equipment. So I think I've addressed all of those with the version that's coming out. We have version 11.13 currently in testing and it should be released soon as soon as it passes all the tests and been tested by everybody. And that should work everywhere. Cross your fingers. <laughs> all right, any questions? Very good. All along, while I've been working on all these drivers, I've developed a couple of device driver kits. There's a Drive 16 kit and a Drive 32 kit. These kits make it very easy to build device drivers for OS2. They're, they can build device drivers, they can build base dev drivers. They're flexible and easy to use. Part of the reason that I did this was, well, since I'm a device driver guy, I built, built device drivers. And I wanted a way to get these built a little more quickly and reliably so that you're not redoing the same thing for all the drivers. So these, these kits contain all the common components that all device drivers need to have, and then you can add the rest of that onto it. One of the places that these are used is in the Multimac drivers. Multimac drivers originally started out the way that you would expect. Somebody wrote one driver, and it's all kind of one driver, and then somebody started building another driver, and there's really no commonality between the two. The first thing that I did with the Multimac code is to kind of combine them so that the pieces that were common among all the different Multimac drivers were essentially common and linked into each driver from common files. And that was a good first step. After that, then I reworked them to use the Drive 16 kit. So now they use just the kit, which contains all the common OS2 code. So the amount of code that's actually different from each driver is unique to whatever is required to, to run the hardware. Slow today, so I was thinking back on the previous slide. You've shown two different driver kits. 
May I assume the one is 16 bit and the other is 32 bit? You may. So I'm not too tired. No, that is exactly what that means. Drive 16 is for building 16 bit drivers. And since we do have a 16 bit driver model in OS2, there are no really significant restrictions on using the Drive 16 kit because you're building an ordinary supported driver. With the Drive 32 kit, it builds 32 bit drivers. There are lots of restrictions because you still have a 16 bit driver model and we're kind of wedge in 30, yeah, lots of thunking going on. Plus, at initialization time, you're not allowed to do a lot of things that you can do in 16 bit drivers. So, so it's why should I use one over the other? What, I'll put it this way why use a 32 bit if there are lots Well, of guess drivers? what? Tomorrow I'm holding a writing device drivers class, and I will talk exactly about that. And you will be there. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a plane, I'm a plane tomorrow. But you can look at backfire the uh, yeah. There are a number of reasons why you would choose one or the other. There's no one reason. It's just like there's no one reason you would have, you would, you, that's why you don't only have one file synchronization program. There's lots because everybody has different needs and different requirements and they all do things a little bit differently. Sure. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah, okay. there's, there's different reasons. The uh, Drive 16 is the most simple one, the most, the easiest one to get to work. So. If you can and your driver is simple enough, that's the one you should use. But like for, if you're porting drivers from Linux, for example, they're all 32-bit. So it's, you have a lot of difficulties compiling the code in 16-bit mode. So you might as well, to save you a lot of headache, you can deal with the limitations of a 32-bit driver because all of the other stuff becomes easier. So that's why there's two. So right now, the NVETF and the E1000E driver are built using the Drive 16 kit. After that, I decided to build a library which would make porting device drivers from Linux easier. Because, you know, I want to be able to crank these drivers out really quick. So I developed this compatibility library and I built the R8169 driver using that and the Drive32 kit. And that works. Obviously it works. Um, it was a lot of help. It does make things easier, but there's a couple of problems with that. There still is a lot of work required to massage the Linux drivers into a state where they'll compile and link and build to become an OS2 driver. And Linux tends to change their stuff pretty drastically from time to time. And so updating to newer versions becomes difficult. So I needed a new plan. So we took a look at <coughs> FreeBSD. FreeBSD has a much more stable interface for their drivers. So I started developing an, a compatibility library for FreeBSD drivers. That is currently ongoing, and that's where I'm focusing most of my effort right now. It has reached the point where I've been able to produce a working device driver using FreeBSD code. The E1000B driver is the one that I chose, mainly because I have the hardware. I understand how that driver works really well. So it's roughly the same as the E1000E driver. I named it E1000B, B for BSD. It supports a few more chipsets. It's a little more up to date than the E1000E driver. And it works. It uses the Drive32 kit, so it's a 32-bit driver. It uses my compatibility library. And the nice thing about this is, since I started this from scratch, I built it so that there are almost no changes at all required to the FreeBSD source files to compile it and build an OS2 driver. I think the number of changes is about 10 lines, mainly adding include files. Okay? And then it will compile and run with almost no changes. So basically, compile and link it. Basically, you compile it, link it, and you run it. And it takes very, very little effort. Um, so, the next thing is to move on to other drivers and port those too. The E1000 driver happened to be fairly simple as it didn't use very many, they call them modules in, in the FreeBSD world. 
Um, so I have to write compatibility modules for my library for the other modules, like for example, the um, MII bus module. I need to write that. That's um, about 80% complete, and then I'll be able to crank out a few more drivers that use that module. After that, I will write the wireless compatibility module, and then I will be able to port the wireless drivers from FreeBSD. And my goal is to have them all be the same way. Almost no changes to the source code, just compile them and build them and run them. So this is moving along pretty good. We're moved, making a lot of progress on this. And the last Multimac drivers that were released include this E1000B driver. So you can download that and run it now. Do you have a, is a wired Athros? It has wired and wireless. Send me the chipset. Email me the chipset of that, and I will Put check. Here in the yes, you may. I'll check to see if it requires any of the modules that I have not written yet. If it doesn't require any of the modules, I should just be able to compile it and build it in a matter of minutes. Okay, any question? Any other questions? So multi-MAC is where most of my time has been spent. USB, of course, and multi-MAC. Yeah. Is that a time schedule? As a deadline? No, I don't have no, a deadline, but this is where my time is now being spent. I've kind of moved away from all the time on USB because it's stable. I spent quite a bit of time on the USB call stuff because those were some tough ones to track down. It didn't happen all the time. Lo it didn't happen on lots of systems. I had to find a system and a particular setup that where I could produce the problem. It, and it was really hard to track down, and it was really hard to solve. No, I, I mean, so, so now, this is where I'm spending my time, on Multimax. So however long it takes me to write the code is how long it will take. I'm expecting weeks. Okay. We're looking in the weeks time frame. Okay. Not months, not years, but weeks. For the next wired drivers, and then probably weeks again for wireless. So it's not a long time. I'm making really good progress. Achieving this first milestone of, of being able to build a working driver was a major milestone. That took a lot of work. But now that that is accomplished, adding in these other modules, every module I add will open up a whole new set of drivers. So it's moving right along. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just got an order. Okay. After I get done with Multimac and I get wireless drivers out and working, I move on to Uniod. My plan with Uniod is to do exactly the same thing I did with ACPI. Um, whereas Uniod is like ACPI in that we are using a module that's written by somebody else. With ACPI, it's written by Intel. It's called the ACPI component architecture. And essentially, all of the OS2 stuff is built around that. That's the primary module. And the way I did that is I kind of isolated the Intel code. We don't modify it except for a few files that are kept in a very well-known place. So it literally takes me about 10 minutes to drop in a new, in a new chunk of Intel code. Every time they update, it takes me about 10 minutes to drop that in rebuild the ACPI package, and then test it. I want to get to that same place with Uniod. I want to be able to drop in a new ALSA version. I want it to take me about 10 minutes and be able to produce an updated Uniod using the new ALSA code. Right now, that's not possible because it's kind of scattered out in the directory tree. A lot, there's lots of modifications to the uh, Linux code. But I want to get it to the place where it's more separate, where the ALSA code is separate, the OS2 code is separate, and you can update. Every time there's changes and fixes, updates are easy, and they don't take months and months of time. So anyway, that's my next goal. That's on the, on the horizon coming up. Will uh, this fix the problems if you have uh, two sound controllers, like most laptops with the 
HDMI interface? That is the last bullet item here. I believe that that problem is in the OS2 code, and I do need to look at that. Um, it is a problem. I know it's a problem. I know why it's a problem. I don't have a fix for it yet. Um, the only way to fix it is to make it ignore one of the controllers and only use one of them. Right now, that's the only way to, to do it. But yeah, that's on my list. But there's only one of me. OK. If you have problems, you must. I, and that word must is not optional. You must open a ticket or there is no problem. I will never know about it and I will not work on it unless you open a ticket. Okay? If you send me an email or post an email on a forum or post an email on a list, it will not get fixed and I won't consider it a problem unless you open a ticket. Okay? Was I pretty emphatic about that? Lots of people do. They send emails or whatever. That's not good enough. I need a ticket. Because that way it's tracked, there's records of it, and all of that. Say what? One way to give you a Yeah, and, and plus, there's a record there. And I can see a history and everything. And it's much easier to manage that way. Yeah. You can, and other people can look at the tickets and see it's being worked on as well. That's another thing. Yeah. That's what's been going on, and that's the plans. And that's a lot of time, and it's probably going to take me probably the next year to work on all this stuff. So, any other questions? An old photo. That's an old photo. That is an old photo. I know, but I don't take very many pictures of myself. I'm not a selfie type of person, so. I need a stick that, that takes out some of the gray and stuff, so anyway. That's very old. Yeah. Is there another person who could help you out? Or, you or does all, everything depend on you? Well, for certain things, I don't, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I know Lars helps a lot with the uh, USB stuff. And you know, I pick up the, some of the changes that he does. If he finds problems, I pick those up. And Wimbro helps out a lot. That's great. I appreciate that a lot. So uh, as far as the other stuff goes, I don't know. I'm kind of working on Multimac. Maybe somebody could help with Uniod. Is the current Python code in the NetLab repository? Is current what? The current Multimac code yes. is still in the NetLab repository? Actually, it is. Yes. Yes, it is. The DD, you need to have a DDK license to have the DDK, and you need to have a DDK license to use it. So yeah, and it, you know, you can, it'll work with the DDK. You can build with the DDK. The driver kits are on my website right there. The compatibil compatibility libraries are not. They're still changing daily. So they're not there yet. This is, this is one of those I don't know. If you had a, for years, a developer's connection subscription with IBM. Yeah? Do you have the DDK? I'm not sure. I'll have to look. I've got the, you know, 90, got you know, 200 CDs. I believe that's correct, because I had okay. the developer connection as well. Okay. I got the, the big. Yeah, yeah the right. binder with all uh, this. Big binder. Yeah, 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 the thing. 200 CDs. Yeah, exactly. I don't know where mine is anymore. <laughs> Stashed away somewhere. All right, that, that finishes up the drivers and what's going on and what's coming. Some exciting things coming up. Thank you. Is anyone going to tell anything about UEFI? Ask me. What's coming up with? Uh, is anybody going to tell anything about UEFI? I know that uh, you are now as a member of the consortium. Yes, we are. We're looking at it. I don't know, is Lewis going to cover any of that in his talk? I have his presentation. I need to check that. He sent them to me. So that See, I originally he was supposed to do his yeah, first. Yeah. Um, 
but I mean, I think a lot of people are a little bit worried with the uh, advent of UEFI and secure boots. What's going to happen? Yeah, it is some boots? troubling. However, with the compatibility layer still in there, well, we're okay. Yeah, sure. But what I'm seeing, or at least hearing, is, is for example, you hear about Windows 10 demanding that all laptops must have secure boot. But you can always turn that off. Well, that is, that is the debatable question. The early, uh, the latest generation of ThinkPad, you know, for ThinkPad laptops, that upcoming, uh, the, the, the present one is not 450, for example, the 50 series, the 60 series, like, uh, I've got a, a ThinkPad TX second generation that is only half a year old. There is no compatibility layer anymore. There's no way to, yeah, you can disable security. No, but so then what we would have to do is we'd have to provide our own compatibility layer, which is a doable thing. And that's one of the options that's being looked at. So we're looking into this. It's, it's more long term, but you know, it's not something we're not aware of. So we are looking at it. Okay. And it's a concern, definitely. Right. Maybe Lewis will maybe shed a little bit of light on that. Maybe so. I mean, I'm always willing to help, but I don't know if I have the skills. That's the problem. Right. Okay. Thank you very much.